Chapter 8, Earthquakes and Earth's Interior. What is an earthquake? An earthquake is the vibration of Earth produced by the rapid release of energy. This energy released radiates in all directions from its source, the focus. Energy is in the form of waves. Sensitive instruments from around the world record this event. Some general features associated with earthquakes. Associated with the movements along the faults, as explained by te plate tectonics theory, the mechanism for earthquakes was first explained by H. Reed. The rock springs back, a phenomenon called elastic rebound. So the vibrations occur as the rock elastically returns to its original shape. Okay? So on either side of this fault, where one side's straining to move this way, the other side's trying to move this way, there's a lot of strain built up or energy being built up along this fault line. Okay, so once so so there's so there's some slight deformation here, a lot of strain. When when all of a sudden that fault slips and the earthquake happens, energy is released and the earth vibrates this direction, this direction, and then snaps back close into place. And you'll notice here that the stream here used to meet up with the stream here, but now half the stream is displaced. So there's some some changes in the topography will occur potentially after an earthquake. For example of this, here's like a tree farm, and all these trees were in nice neat rows. After an earthquake, you'll see that some of these rows are now offset, from kind of like a zigzag here. And also this fence was one nice long fence, but half, but on this side of the, here's the fault comes through here, this side is pushed in this direction. Earthquakes are often preceded by foreshocks and followed by aftershocks. Adjustments that follow a major earthquake often generate small, smaller earthquakes called aftershocks. Small earthquakes called foreshocks often precede a major earthquake by days or in some cases as much as several years. Okay, the San Andreas, an active earthquake zone. The San Andreas is the most studied fault system in the world. Displacement occurs along discrete segments of 100 to 200 kilometers long. Some portions exhibit very slow, gradual displacement known as fault creep. Other segments regularly slip, producing small earthquakes. Still, other segments store elastic energy for hundreds of years before rupturing in great earthquakes. Process described, this process described is called stick-slip motion. Great earthquakes should occur about every 50 to 200 years along these sections. Okay. So here's the San Andreas Fault System, it's a major fault. These are all part of that same San Andreas Fault. Okay. Where this side of the fault, uh, the plates try and move northwards. This side of the faults try and move southwards. Okay. okay, the study of those earthquake waves, the energy that's produced by the earthquakes, is called seismology. Earthquake recording instruments, called a seismograph, records the movement of Earth. The record is called a seismogram. There are several types of earthquake waves. The surface waves have a very complex motion, move very slow of all the waves. And here, here's a diagram, here's a picture of a um, seismograph. So here's a seismograph device. It would be uh, um, mounted, mounted up here with a block. And over here is the seismo seismogram, which is the record that is being drawn as the earth, as the earth uh, vibrates. Now here's the seismogram again. This is over time. There would be no, before the earthquake, there's no vibration. And then the first P wave, which we're going to talk about in a moment, comes. And then we'll have our S wave. And then we'll have our surface waves, which we're starting to talk about here. Okay. Okay, so our surface waves, as the wave of energy moves in this direction, the surface there is going to shake. And in this case, this way and this way, side to side. But it's also moving up and down potentially. It's a very complex motion. Okay. Now, under the surface, there's body waves. The P waves, or primary waves, are the push pull compressional motion waves. They travel through solids, liquids, and gases. They are the fastest of all the earthquake waves. Okay, the S waves, secondary waves, are also binary body waves. They have a shake motion, they travel only through solids. They're slower velocity than P waves. They kind of shake side to side like a snake, side winding snake. Okay, how do you locate an uh, earthquake? Well, the focus is the place within the earth where the earthquake waves originate. 
The epicenter is the point on the surface of the Earth directly above that focus. Locate using the difference in the arrival times between the P waves and the S waves, which are related to the distance uh, wave that, that seismograph is, how far it is from the epicenter. So here we have, here's our fault, and this is where the fault came unstuck and released all that energy for the earthquake. So that's the focus. Directly above the focus on the surface of the Earth is our epicenter. Okay. Okay. So what you need is at least three station recordings to locate an epicenter. Okay. And you take a look at the time between the P wave arrival and the S wave arrival and convert that to distance. And you draw a circle that distance around each station. And then where those three circles meet is the epicenter. Okay, to get that conversion from the time to the distance, you need a time travel graph. In this case, this one has a P wave curve here and a slower S wave curve here. Okay. And if, so right here, we're seeing that there's a time different distance, time difference between when the P waves arrive and the S waves arrive about, about five minutes. Okay. So then we can see that when we drop down straight down, we can see how far in kilometers, about 3,500 kilometers, or just over, or about, uh, about 20, 2,250 uh, 2, miles uh, distance at, away from the epicenter is this particular seismograph. Okay. So from the Nagpur, we measure that the, the earthquake must have been 3,400 kilometers, so we draw this green circle. From the Paris station, we say the earthquake must have been 8,200 kilometers, so I draw this really big circle here. So we just had these two, two stations, Paris and Nagpur, we would think the epicenter was either here or here. So that's why we need the, a third station, because two circles will intersect in only two locations. Uh, we want to intersect in only one. So we add Darwin Station, which is 49 kilometers away from this particular earthquake. And we draw that circle, and all three circles intersect right here. And that's the epicenter of our earthquake. Okay, so just like I explained, we draw a circle with the radius equal to the distance from the seismograph to the epicenter using the time distance between the P wave arrival and the S wave arrival. And the point where all three circles from the three different seismographs intersect is the epicenter. Okay, here's another, another diagram on a flat map. So we have our Nagpur station and its distance, its radius um, to, to the earthquake epicenter, Darwin and its radius, and then Paris and its radius. And all three intersect right here. That's the epicenter. Okay. Earthquake zones are closely correlated with plate boundaries. Along the Circum Pacific Belt, or the Ring of Fire, we find many earthquakes. And along the Oceanic Grid System, so very popular places for earthquakes. So see here is the Circum Pacific Belt, or the Ring of Fire. Same as uh, when we talk about volcanoes, we'll see most volcanic activity happens in this area. Okay. Also along the ocean ridge systems, we'll find a lot of earthquakes and volcanic activity. And then here along the Alpine Himalayan belt, there's a lot of earthquake activity. Now the intensity and magnitude. So this, we're trying to talk about how strong an earthquake is. The intensity is the measure of degree of earthquake shaking at a given locale based on the amount of damage. The most often measured this is most often measured by the modified Mercalli intensity scale. So it's kind of like a, a, we're looking at how much damage happened, and then we're going to give the intensity a rating. Okay. The ma magnitude is another method, and that concept was introduced by Charles Richter in 1935, where we used the Richter scale. So based on the amplitude, or the, the height of the largest seismic wave, we, we decide what is the value or magnitude on the Richter scale. So each unit on the Richter scale equals to a 32-fold energy increase. So a, a earthquake of Richter scale 1, okay, it's, and then we have an earthquake of Richter scale 2. The earthquake of Richter scale 2 is 30 times stronger in magnitude than the, the earthquake at Richter scale 1. Okay, but when we get to the really large earthquakes, like the 8 and 9 magnitude earthquakes, it doesn't ad adequately um, explain the size. This is really uh, size of very large earthquakes. So there's there's a little more to it. So then we use the moment magnitude scale, and that measures very large earthquakes and is 
derived also from the amount of displacement that occurs along the fault zone. So you have the amplitude of the um, strongest waves and you have how much displacement of the rocks occur along the fault zone. So how much destruction occurs with the earthquake? The various factors determine how much structural damage there will be. So the intensity of the earthquake is one. Duration of the vibrations, you know, how long did that earthquake shake? Uh, nature of the material on which the structure rests. It's on solid bedrock or is it over clay or sand layer? And then the design of the structures. Okay. Destruction results from ground shaking or liquefaction of the ground. Liquefaction, they're, they're, when there's liquefaction, there's saturated materials that turn fluid. When the, the, the saturated clays or materials starts getting shaken up, and starts getting very viscous and it wants to flow out from where it is. And um, underground objects also in, in that layer may start to rise up and cause damage. So there's boulders in that liquefact area, It'll, they'll ride it, rise up to the surface. Also um, tsunamis or seismic sea waves, some of the displacement occurs under the ocean, um, under sea level. And so water is displaced and it starts moving also in a waveform and causing uh, great damage. Landslides and ground subsidence and also fires can occur. So here's a picture of some damage to a building that occurred in the uh, 1964 earthquake in Alaska. Uh, this, this, this earthquake, well here, this is where the earthquake occurred, okay, or Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, here's Anchorage, Alaska, but here's the epicenter. And there was massive destruction in Anchorage, even though it looks like it's fairly far from the epicenter of this earthquake. It's a pretty strong one. And it was so strong that it actually caused a, a tsunami. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about tsunamis here. So what happens is here we have we have a subducting plate here and some displacement occurred uh, for the earthquake. So so as this rock moved, it pushed the water, sending out a waveform of energy in all directions. So these very long waves start going out in every direction, actually kind of like a circular pattern outward, like you drop a pebble into some water you see these ripples going outwards. Well here's a tsunami wave going out and this ripple going outwards and they're very long waves, they're shallow long waves. Okay and as that wave energy comes into shore that's when that wave energy is going to increase or that wave energy, the amplitude of the waves is going to start increasing. Okay so up up here is where the epicenter, let's see, up, up here uh, is where the epicenter of that 1964 Alaskan earthquake, and the tsunami went out from there, and it traveled. It traveled after five hours of travel. It hit Honolulu. Okay. Okay. Can we predict earthquakes? Well, short range. There's no reliable method devised for short range predictions. We can't tell you if earthquakes going to happen tomorrow or today or next week. The long range forecast. We 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 assume that earthquakes are repetitive. And region, so we give regions a probability of an earthquake. So we kind of guess that an area may be due for an earthquake in the near future. It's the kind of long range forecast we can give. Now, most of our knowledge of the Earth's interior comes from the study of P and S waves. Okay? So one of the travel times of P and S waves through the Earth vary depending on the properties of the materials. And the fact that S waves only travel through solids and P waves travel through liquids and solids. We can, we can look at those travel times when we have earthquakes and it helps us understand what kind of material those waves are traveling through. And that's how we study the inside of our Earth. Okay, so here's some possible seismic paths. So let's say we have an earthquake up here. Okay, and, and the energy, the waves can travel like this way, or it might travel and reflect off of this liquid core, so like the S waves might get diffracted off the core. Okay, um, the P waves may get refracted. So just when, when, each, when the material density changes, the wave energy gets bent a little, and that's what I mean by refraction. And as it changes again from liquid to solid, it might get refracted again. Okay. Um, we may have a wave may go straight in, get refracted a bit, but then hit the solid core and be reflected back out. Um, you know, so, so studying these pathways that the, the um, S waves and P waves travel during an earthquake help us map out the interior of the Earth. Okay. So based on physical properties, we're going to talk a little bit about Earth's interior structure now. The crust is a thin rocky outer layer. It varies in thickness. It's roughly about five miles thick in oceanic regions. 
and in continental areas about 22 to 25 miles thick. In some mountain areas it can be up to 40 miles thick. Okay, the continental crust, okay, the upper crust is composed of granitic rocks. The lower crust is more like basaltic rocks. And the average density is about 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter and is up to 4 billion years older, old. The ocean crust, oceanic crust, is basaltic in composition, it's way more, more dense, more mafic. The density is closer to 3.0 grams per cubic centimeters and it's younger, 180 million years or less, less old. Uh, so it's, it's definitely much younger than the continental crust. Now below the crust is the mantle, so to a depth of about 1800 miles is the mantle. It's compo the composition of the upper mantle is the igneous rock peridotite, which, which is a very um, mafic igneous rock, and at greater depths will have slightly different rock material. The outer core below the mantle is a sphere having a radius of 2161 miles, composed of iron nickel alloy. alloy. The average density is nearly 11 grams per cubic centimeter. That is a lot denser than the rocks we see of the crust or the rocks we see in, in the mantle. I mean, in the, yeah. So this outer core is very dense. Okay. Now when we talk about, talk by physical properties, the lithosphere is going to be the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. So about 100 kilometers thick. It's a cool, rigid, solid, upper portion of the crust and the upper mantle forms that lithosphere. Okay. Now below the lithosphere is the upper mantle to a depth of 660 kilometers. It's a softer, softer, weaker layer that's easily deformed because it's under heat and pressure. Okay. And the fact that this is this asthenosphere is softer and weaker, that allows the lithospheric plates the, for the plate tectonics for those plates to be able to actually move and shift. Okay, the mesosphere or lower mantle, okay, it's deeper than 660 kilometers, it's the more rigid layer again. Rocks are very hot and capable of, of gradual flow. And then the outer core is a liquid layer, it's 1410 miles thick. Convective flow of metallic iron which generates Earth's magnetic field occurs in the outer core. The inner core is a sphere with a radius of 754 miles and it acts like a solid. Okay, so again here's our diagram. Okay, we have our inner solid core and then our outer liquid core. Then our lower mantle, solid rocky layer. Then our, our, um, our weaker mantle up here. And then our crust up here. Okay, how do we discover Earth's major layers? Well, we discovered using changes in seismic wave velocity. So changes in the speed of the seismic waves the moravitic discontinuity, the velocity of seismic waves increases abruptly below 50 kilometers of depth, separates the crust from the underlying mantle. So that moravitic discontinuity is like the, the separation line between the, the uh, lithosphere and the asthenosphere. Okay. Shadow zone. The absence of P waves from about 105 degrees to 140 degrees around the globe from an earthquake is a shadow zone because the, okay, the P waves don't travel um, to those areas. It's explained if Earth contained a core composed of materials uh, unlike the overlying mantle, okay, because the waves are getting refracted, so they don't travel straight through, so there's that region that's a shadow where the waves just don't, don't enter. The inner core is discovered in 1960, 1936 by noting a new region of seismic reflection within the core. Size was calculated in the 1960s using echoes from seismic waves generated during underground nuclear tests. Okay, end of this chapter.